a poverty explainer publication that the Budget Center will be uh, putting out in just the next couple of weeks. Uh, and at the end of the presentation, we will move over to questions and answers. You can send us your questions in the question box uh, on the GoToWebinar control panel, or you can tweet us uh, using the hashtag policy, per policy perspectives. Uh, and now I'd like to hand things over to Sarah and Alyssa. Great, thanks. Uh, thanks again. And again, we're here for the webinar on understanding poverty measures used to assess economic well-being in California. So thank you everyone for joining us this morning. Um, today, uh, we're going to focus on a few key themes. Um, we will talk about what are some of the different approaches used for measuring poverty in California that can be used to inform policy. And we'll specifically focus on the three um, poverty measures that are most widely available for measuring poverty in California. These are the, uh, the official poverty measure, sometimes called the OPM, the supplemental poverty measure, sometimes called the SPM, and the California poverty measure, sometimes called the CPM. So we're gonna go over how these poverty measures differ from each other, how each of them works, um, and importantly, when should each be used um, in ways that can be helpful for informing policy to address poverty and economic insecurity more broadly. Uh, to start off, I just want to review the basic idea that all three of these major poverty measures um, have a similar structure. So all three of them compare family resources measured in different ways across the three measures to a poverty threshold, which is, again, calculated in different ways across the, the three measures. Um, and they look at annual resources compared to an annual threshold. So um, here, for example, just purely hypothetically, if the poverty threshold was $20,000, Family one with $15,000 would be in poverty because they have less resources um, than the poverty threshold. And family two would not be in poverty because at $25,000 their resources are higher than the poverty threshold. Um, and I'm gonna start with um, talking about the official poverty measure. Um, and starting with this one because this is the measure that has been around for the longest time. Um, and economic insecurity is often defined using the official poverty measure. This is what's often cited in newspaper articles or um, academic pieces, um, you know, different, it's the most common measure of poverty um, in the United States. Um, and under the official poverty measure, a family of two adults and two children uh, was poor in 2017 if their cash income was less than about $25,000. Um, and under the official poverty measure, when we think about poverty in this way, poverty is a significant problem in California. Um, California's official poverty rate continued to decline um, this past year the, in the most recent data available in 2017, but it's still above the, the level that it was before the Great Recession. Um, and as of 2017, about uh, 13 issue that we're going to be discussing today is what does it actually mean for to work as income under $25,000 there in poverty? Um, and that's what we're going to talk about in more detail. And the quick answer is that under the official poverty measure, the poverty threshold is based on how much families in the 1960s used to spend on food. Um, This is <laughs> clearly not maybe the most direct connection to how much families need to have economic um, example that highlights some of the major flaws of the official poverty measure as a way of measuring economic insecurity. I'm now gonna hand it over to Alyssa to talk about uh, other options for measuring economic security and poverty that address these kind of problems. Okay, <clears throat> so as Sarah alluded to, the official measure is it's widely considered to be an inadequate measure of poverty. And because of this, the Census Bureau and the Bureau of Labor Statistics developed something called the Supplemental Poverty Measure, which addresses many of the shortcomings of the official measure. So I'm gonna walk through exactly how the official measure works and then show you how the supplemental measure improves upon it. So first of all, the official measure uh, poverty thresholds, as Sarah suggested, were created in the 1960s based simply on the cost of food at that time for a minimally adequate diet multiplied by three. <clears throat> and that's because in the 1960s, families typically spent a third of their incomes on food. 
Um, since then, the poverty thresholds have only been updated for inflation. So they haven't been updated to reflect changes in spending <coughs> patterns. But of course, since the 60s, food costs have changed and family spending patterns have changed. So for example, today families spend much less on food and much more on housing as a share of income. And so that means the official poverty thresholds are no longer meaningfully linked to the current costs that families face to meet their basic needs. The supplemental thresholds, on the other hand, <clears throat> are based on uh, a more comprehensive range of basic needs, including food, clothing, housing, and utilities. And they're updated each year so that they adjust with changes in family spending patterns. Um, a second major shortcoming of the official measure is the fact that the official poverty thresholds are not adjusted for the cost of living in different areas. There's just one official poverty threshold for each family type in all parts of the U.S. So, for example, a mother with two kids was considered to be living in poverty if her income was below about $19,700 in 2017, no matter where she lived in the U.S., a high-cost place like San Francisco or a low-cost place like rural Mississippi. The supplemental thresholds, on the other hand, are adjusted to account for differences in local housing costs. So they account for the fact that families need more resources to, beat their, to meet their basic needs in places where the cost of living is higher. So this means that there's a different supplemental poverty threshold for each family type in different parts of the US. Um, and these places are based on metropolitan statistical areas, MSAs, which are made up of a county or a group of counties. And then within each place, there are different thresholds for a family, whether they rent, are a homeowner with a mortgage, or a homeowner without a mortgage. So let's walk through an example. Um, this shows the official poverty threshold and supplemental poverty thresholds for a family made up of two adults and two children in the San Francisco, Oakland, Hayward MSA and the Fresno MSA. So first of all, you can see that there are three different supplemental poverty thresholds for this family based on whether they're renters, homeowners with a mortgage, or homeowners without a mortgage. You can also see that the supplemental poverty thresholds are higher um, than the official poverty threshold, except for uh, renters, I'm sorry, uh, homeowners without a mortgage in the Fresno MSA. And this is really important to note. Um, a lot of people think that the supplemental poverty thresholds are always higher than the official poverty threshold, but they're not. In some cases, they're lower. Um, you can also see here that the supplemental poverty thresholds in the San Francisco MSA are higher than they are in Fresno, and that's reflecting, of course, higher housing costs in the Bay Area. And then you can see that the official poverty measure is the same in both places because, again, for each family type, it's the same poverty threshold all throughout the U.S. Okay, um, the third major shortcoming of the official poverty measure is that it defines families' economic resources very narrowly, only in terms of families' cash income. So that's like their wages, um, cash benefits like CalWORKs grants or Social Security income. And the official measure doesn't account for non-discretionary expenses that reduce families' cash income. The supplemental measure, on the other hand, counts a much broader range of resources that families can use to meet basic needs. So this includes cash income, but it also includes non-cash benefits like CalFresh, and it includes tax credits like the earned income tax credit. Also, the supplemental measure subtracts non-discretionary expenses from families' resources, and these include things like childcare costs and out-of-pocket medical expenses. So this means the supplemental measure compares a family's net resources to the poverty threshold, resources minus expenses. And this means that the supplemental measure provides a better picture of the actual resources that families have to meet basic needs. So the final major way that the, uh, the supplemental measure improves on the official measure has to do with how the two measures define families. The official measure only counts individuals living in the same home who are related by blood, marriage, or adoption. Uh, unmarried partners are counted as a separate family and also uh, their relatives. The supplemental measure, on the other hand, uh, includes unmarried partners and the relatives as part of the family. And this is a more realistic picture of how families share resources. So let's look at an example. Let's say that a woman and a man who are unmarried are living together with the woman's biological son. The official measure 
would consider there to be two families in the household. The woman and her son would be one family and the woman's partner would be a separate family. So that means the poverty status for the woman and her son are separate from the poverty status for the unmarried partner. The supplemental measure on the other hand would uh, count all three of them as one family and determine the poverty status for that one family. <clears throat> Uh, one other thing I want to note in terms of how families are defined between the two measures is that the official measure does not include foster kids as part of families, uh, whereas the supplemental measure does. And so that actually means that the poverty status for foster kids is not determined at all based on the official measure. They are not part of the child poverty rate. Um, okay, so now I'm going to turn it over to Sarah to talk about how the California poverty measure works. Great. So the California poverty measure um, is actually very similar to the supplemental poverty measure, but is a little more specific to California. Um, it is a measure that um, was developed by the Stanford Center on Poverty and Inequality and the Public Policy Institute of California as a joint project, and they continue to produce uh, the, the data for this measure each, each year. Um, so, uh, as I said, the California poverty measure is modeled after the supplemental poverty measure, um, but it also accounts for some state-specific policy contexts and demographics. Um, and a particularly important factor with the California poverty measure is that um, it is built in a different data set um, than the, the measure. And what that means in practical terms is that you can actually use the California poverty measure to look at poverty at the sub-state level, so at the level of regions or counties, and also for some demographic subgroups that have a smaller population. So um, this extends the many positive um, features of the supplemental poverty measure to a level where you can look at um, more closely differences in poverty in smaller groups and geographic areas within California to see what poverty rates um, and characteristics look like at that level. Um, one other difference with the California poverty measure as well is that it uses uh, county level poverty thresholds instead of metropolitan area poverty thresholds. Um, and so this um, with, with some counties combined um, with that have smaller populations because of data limitations. But this means that um, some of the poverty thresholds are a little more specific to smaller areas in the California poverty measure compared to the supplemental measure. And I'll hand it back to Alyssa to walk through an example. Okay, so we're gonna put everything um, that we talked about so far together and walk through an example of how these three measures work for a mom with two kids who rents an apartment in Los Angeles. So first of all, let's look at the poverty thresholds for this family. Um, the official poverty threshold for this family is just over $19,000. The supplemental and California poverty thresholds for this family are higher because they take into account housing costs in Los Angeles. And you'll notice that the thresholds are slightly different between the supplemental and the California measure. And that's because the California measure is based on LA County. The supplemental measure is based on the Los Angeles um, Metropolitan and Orange County combined. Um, okay, let's look at the family's resources under each measure. So under the official measure, um, only their cash income is counted. And so for this family, that's just $22,000 in wages. For the supplemental and California measures, it's not just their cash income that's counted, but also the value of their CalFresh benefits and the value of their earned income tax credit and child tax credit. So their total resources are higher under these measures. Uh, now let's look at this family's non-discretionary expenses. So under the official measure, um, there are no expenses taken into account at all. Under the supplemental and California measure, um, these measures subtract their payroll taxes, their work expenses, and their childcare expenses. So their resources are reduced by over $12,000. So let's put it all together now. Here are the thresholds again for each measure. And here are the family's net resources. For the official measure, again, it's just their cash income compared to the poverty line. Whereas for the supplemental and the California poverty measure, we've subtracted their expenses from the prior slide, from their wages, the blue bars, and then we've added their CalFresh benefits and their earned income tax credit and child tax credit on top. So their net resources under the supplemental and California poverty measures are just under 22,000. 
Um, and in this case, they happen to be very close to their um, cash income based on the official poverty measure. This isn't always the case. That's just how this particular example worked out. So what this means is that under the official poverty measure, this family would uh, not be living in poverty because their wages is, are higher than the poverty threshold. But under the supplemental and California poverty measures, this family would be living in poverty. So you can see how a family can have a different poverty status uh, based on uh, across these three measures. And it's not just because of differences in the poverty threshold. It's a lot more complicated than that. It also has to do with how their resources are actually measured. OK, I'm going to turn it back over to Sarah. Um, so the perspective of thinking about these poverty measures applied at the level of an individual family is really useful for thinking about um, what it looks like at the level of an individual family struggling with economic insecurity, um, how they put together their resources to meet basic needs, what all those resources are, and how much they need to close the gap. Um, but it's also really helpful, um, and these poverty measures are really useful for looking at the picture of poverty at a broader scale, at the level of the California population or subgroups of the population or demographic groups or geographic areas. Um, and so this is another way that these poverty measures are useful for thinking about how to inform policies to address economic insecurity. So when we turn from the individual level to the level of the population, um, you can see that the picture of poverty changes um, when you apply the supplemental or California poverty measures. And this is a result of the combined um, differences. So accounting for local housing costs, adding non-cash public supports, subtracting non-discretionary expenses, and accounting for modern families. When you combine all those changes that are incorporated into the supplemental or California measures, um, poverty looks different than it does under the official measure. So let me just show you some examples of what that means. Um, yeah. Essentially, when you um, use the official poverty measure compared to these uh, the, the supplemental or California measures which address some of the shortcomings of the official measure, you end up with a distorted picture of, of hardship in California. So under the official measure, poverty is understated in areas that have high housing costs. Poverty is understated among families that have large expenses for medical care or child care because those are not accounted for under the official measure. Poverty, on the other hand, is overstated among households that receive non-cash supports like CalFresh, EITC, or housing subsidies because those resources aren't counted under the official measure. Poverty is also overstated among families that include unmarried partners because those are, again, considered separate families under the official measure. Um, and then very importantly for informing policy, any policy changes that expand or shrink the eligibility or generosity of non-cash public support, so any changes to things like EITC or CalFresh or child tax credits or um, housing subsidies, anything like that, will not produce any change in the poverty rate or depth of poverty. Um, so you won't be able to see whether the, um, the policy has had any impact on economic security as measured under the official measure. Um, so here's an example. Oops. Um, when you look at the poverty rate for the state as a whole, California's poverty rate is significantly higher um, under the supplemental poverty measure. Um, so this is data for the most recent three years, 2015 to 2017. Um, the official poverty rate in California was about 13%, but when you apply the supplemental poverty measure, um, that rate rises to 19%, so about one in five Californians living in poverty. Um, and this is a result of, again, the combination of all the differences that um, where the supplemental poverty measure improves on the official measure, but a really key factor um, at the statewide level is that much of the California population lives in the coastal urban areas where housing costs are relatively high compared to the national average housing costs. Um, and that means um, that the supplemental thresholds are higher in those areas. And so that results, um, that's one of the key drivers for why the supplemental poverty rate is so much higher in California than the official poverty rate. Um, but that statewide um, measure, the statewide picture is a little bit different than the picture if you look at the sub-state level. So if we look at, a, at the at the lower level, at the county level, here we have to use the California poverty measure because, again, that's the only one that you can use at the level below the level of the state. Um, and they, there you can see that um, there's significant differences across different parts of California. So um, in the top of this um, slide, you can see that in um, areas, in counties where the housing costs are relatively high, in general, the 
California poverty rate is higher than the official rate because, again, the thresholds are higher. So as we know, it takes more resources to meet your basic needs in places where housing costs are higher. Um, and then in a few counties, poverty rates under the California poverty measure are actually lower than the official poverty rate. And these are um, areas where incomes tend to be lower and more people are eligible for um, public supports like CalFresh or EITC. Um, and as a result, you can see the effect of those supports in reducing the poverty rate. Um, and so the official poverty rate will actually be um, higher than the California poverty rate. And of course, that is not to say that those are areas with low poverty. In fact, those are some of the areas that have um, really high poverty rates under either measure. But um, you can see the, the rate is different when you account for um, the different ways that uh, these poverty measures count, account for family resources. Um, and so what I want to move on to next is some practical guidelines, some general guidelines for when it makes sense to use each of these poverty measures to get an accurate picture of poverty and to sort of identify, you know, who are the who are the people in poverty and um, what is the what is the need and where where is economic insecurity concentrated. Um, so I'm going to go over the general guidelines for when to use each poverty measure. And we'll start with sort of the overarching guidelines and then we'll get into some very specific examples. Um, so the bottom line, in general, when looking at poverty in California, it is better to use the supplemental or California poverty measure because they are just more accurate than the official measure. They just address a number of shortcomings of the official measure that are widely understood. Um, and in particular, the supplemental or California poverty measure should be used to assess the impact of public policies on poverty. And so many of the policies that um, are intended to help address economic insecurity um, at the state level and at the federal level are these kinds of resources that are not a, a monthly uh, check in the mail. They're you know, restricted in some way. They're non-cash resources. They're things like food assistance or housing assistance or tax credits, um, which are not, um, will not show up in the, in the official poverty measure. So supplemental or California measure is better. Um, between the two measures, the supplemental or California measure, if the California measure is available um, for, um, and I'll talk a little bit about the limitations on that, um, it may be preferable to use that because it better accounts for certain California specific factors. And then the official measure, when does it make sense to use that? I mean, really in the California context, the official measure is largely useful for analyses that are related to public programs that rely on the official measure to determine eligibility or funding levels because the official measure still is widely used for um, eligibility for, for programs. Um, and it also may be the only measure available for looking at poverty in very small geographic areas, like at the level of cities. But it's important to keep in mind, you know, it may be the only one available. That doesn't mean it's particularly a good picture of, of what poverty looks like at the level of the city. Because if a city, for example, has high housing costs or has a large number of people who are um, receiving non-cash supports, then you're going to get a distorted picture of economic security if you use the official measure, even if it's the only one available. Um, I want to talk a little bit um, about two factors, so this slide and the next slide, about um, the availability of the data, because this sometimes determines um, what, uh, which measure is, is, it is possible to use to answer a particular question. Um, so. Um, if we look at the official poverty measure, um, this is available in um, two of the two sets of census data, the current population survey or CPS um, and the American Community Survey or ACS. Um, and so these different data sets, you can find both of these sets of data in the um, census websites. And um, again, we'll talk a little bit more about that later. But um, basically, the the strength of the CPS data is that it's available for um, the nation and the state, and it goes back for a, a large number of years. Um, whereas the uh, American Community Survey data is available, is a, is a larger survey, and so it can be used to look at poverty at a much smaller level because it has more, more people in the sample, which means that the, um, the poverty data for smaller geographic areas and smaller demographic groups is more accurate. Um, so those are the, the basically the official poverty measure can be used um, for all different levels of geography, for cities and smaller areas, for counties, for metro areas, for the state, for the nation. Um, but of course, as we talked about earlier, there's a lot of limitations to the official poverty measure and a lot of reasons, especially in California, for thinking that it's not really the best way to think about economic insecurity. Um, 
turning next to the supplemental poverty measure, um, this uses the same data as um, the official measure, the current population survey. Um, and so that means um, it can be used to look at poverty at the level of the nation and also at the level of states. Um, it can't be used at, to look at poverty in particular metro areas or counties or cities um, because the data set is just not large enough. But that said, the thresholds are published for all the metro areas. Um, and again, we can talk a little bit more about there's some specific limitations on that. But basically, um, even though you can't find the poverty rate uh, under the supplemental poverty measure for, um, for, for example, the Los Angeles um, metro area, you can find the poverty threshold each year that's published by census. Um, and then finally, turning to the California poverty measure, um, one of the main reasons that this measure was developed was to be able to provide that kind of supplemental poverty measure data at the level of areas like counties and metro areas and regions. So um, again, it's very similar in the way it's structured to the supplemental poverty measure, but you can use it to look at much smaller geographies. Um, that said, you can look definitely down to the level of counties. Some counties are combined if, they're, if their populations are smaller. Um, and in some cases at, at um, some of the larger counties, but um, with some limitations. Um, so that's um, the geography is one of the determinants of which measure can be used. Um, and then the other um, issue is um, the years that for which these measures are available. So um, the official poverty measure has been produced for many, many years. It's available with data going back all the way to the to 1959, actually. Um, the but that's only for in the current population survey, which is for um, the lowest geography would be for the state. Um, in the American Community Survey, which is allows you to look at poverty at lower levels at areas of even cities, um, that data is available back to 2006. Um, and then the the more uh, the better poverty measures, the Supplemental Poverty Measure and California Poverty Measure, are are only in available in more recent years. So the the Supplemental Measure is available back to 2009, and the California Measure is available back to 2011. Um, and so for certain types of questions, it may those years of availability may determine which measure is available to use. Another important thing to note is that um, the official and supplemental uh, data are released every year in the in the fall of the year following the the data year. So, for example, the most recent data that was released was for 2017, and it was released this past September in September 2018. Um, the data for the California poverty measure is lagged compared to that. It usually comes out the summer following, so about six months later, uh, six to nine months later than the, um, than, the, than the data for the other two measures. So in some cases, that's, um, that's an important consideration. So for example, the 2017 data for the official and supplemental measure was released this past fall, whereas the 2017 data for the California measure won't be released until this summer. And um, okay, I want to turn now. This is our um, the last sort of major section that we want to cover in this webinar, just to walk through some very specific examples of if this is the kind of question that you're trying to answer, which is the poverty measure that you should use? Um, so we'll start off again with poverty in California as a whole. So for example, what is California's poverty rate, or how many people in live in poverty in California? Um, for this kind of a question, the supplemental or California poverty measure are preferable. Again, these are similar and they provide a more accurate picture of economic insecurity than the official measure. Okay, and if you wanted to look at poverty among demographic groups in California, um, again, we'd recommend the supplemental or California measure because they're better measures and both can be used to look at demographics. Um, so if you wanted to look at the child poverty rate or the poverty rate for seniors, but if you wanted to look at a demographic group that's a relatively small group in California, like black seniors, um, it might be preferable to use the California measure because again, this is based on a larger sample size, so you're much more likely to get more reliable <clears throat> results. Um, another important consideration, if you want to look at how poverty in California compares to poverty in the United States as a whole, or how poverty in California compares to the uh, poverty rate in other states, then you need to use the, the supplemental poverty measure. You can't use the California measure because um, 
the supplemental measure is available for all states, whereas the California poverty measure is, it was specifically developed just for California. So um, you can't use it for other states. And again, the, the supplemental measure is preferable for this than, um, than the official measure for all the reasons that we talked about earlier. Okay, and then if you wanted to look at poverty in California's regions or counties, you would have to look at the, you'd have to use the California poverty measure. Uh, um, because again, the supplemental measure is only available at the national or state level. The California measure is the one that allows you to look at the sub-state level. Um, next, if you want to look at how much public supports reduce poverty, so for example, if you're thinking about questions like how many children would be lifted out of poverty if the federal EITC were doubled, or how much does CalFresh cut the child poverty rate, or how many seniors are lifted out of poverty because of Social Security? Um, for these kinds of questions, either the supplemental or California poverty measure are preferable because, again, these measures account for the wide range of public supports that, that families use to meet their basic needs, a much broader range than um, what's accounted for in the official measure. Um, and with these kinds of questions, the California measure may be preferable for some of these questions um, because the data are adjusted to correct for underreporting of the use of specifically CalFresh and CalWORKs in census data. So for those for questions especially related to CalFresh and CalWORKs, you're likely to have more accurate um, or more accurate measure using the California poverty measure. Okay, and then finally, um, if you wanted to look at how many Californians are potentially eligible for public supports, so for example, how many families, how, or how much cash income do families need to have in order to still qualify for something like CalFresh, you'd have to use the official poverty measure because most of these public supports, um, the eligibility is based on the official poverty guidelines, um, which are based on the official poverty thresholds, um, to determine eligibility. And so one last point that um, we want to make before um, before we close out our webinar um, is that poverty is not the only way to think about economic security or economic insecurity. So, I mean, it is a very important way and it's a widely used way and it's definitely relevant for informing policy, but it doesn't capture every aspect of economic insecurity, certainly. Um, and so other ways you can think about economic insecurity can include things like the employment rate or unemployment rate. Um, long-term mobility, educational attainment, um, or family budgets. And I just want to talk for a moment about family budgets. Um, so, you know, the, the poverty threshold um, is one way of thinking about um, a, a level of resources that is a measure of economic security or insecurity. But um, the threshold isn't designed to capture the, the full range of um, basic costs, even under the supplemental poverty measure or California poverty measure. So if you look at um, if you look at the, the basic costs um, to achieve a, a, a very modest standard of living um, and you add up um, all items, including things like the full cost of childcare and healthcare um, and um, taxes and all of these things, if you did not receive any public supports, um, then the total amount of, um, of resources that a family would need would be significantly higher than the official poverty threshold. And so these family budgets on this slide are come from the budget center's making ends meet report, um, where we have produced data for each of the counties in California um, that looks at you know what is the basic cost of these basic items that a family needs to make ends meet. Um, so this is another way that you can think about looking at um, thinking about economic insecurity, and this is similar to. Um, other other family budget approaches like the United Way of California's um, real cost measure or Insight Center's family self-sufficiency standard. Um, so this is just this is poverty is one way, but not the only way of thinking about how much families need to make ends meet um, and which families are facing economic insecurity. Okay, <clears throat> so we're going to wrap up the webinar, and um, I just want to remind folks that when we finish up, you can we're going to go to questions and answers. So if you have questions, go ahead and enter them into your question box. Um, so all of this material comes from a report that we're going to be publishing in coming weeks, and I, we want to highlight some of the additional material that will be in that report. So we'll include additional examples of when to use each poverty measure. We're also going to be publishing a table that compares the poverty thresholds for uh, each of the three measures 
um, for various family types. So for example, all of the poverty thresholds under the supplemental measure. This is probably one of the most recent. Um, and while this information is on the Census Bureau's website, it's not easy to find. And so we're gonna put it into a nice table. Um, we're also gonna include information about where to find the data for each measure and when the data are released. And we'll discuss uh, a few other things like the difference between poverty thresholds and poverty guidelines, um, information about another supplemental poverty measure called the uh, anchored supplemental poverty measure, which allows you to look at trends going back to the 60s uh, using a supplemental poverty measure. Um, and then finally, we're going to include a discussion of how the supplemental or California poverty measures could be used to determine eligibility or benefit amounts for public supports. Um, and this is another important way that these poverty measures can be used. They're not just useful for looking at how many people are in poverty or who specifically is in poverty, but they can be used also to design policies to cut poverty. Um, and in recent years, there's been growing interest in exploring whether to base eligibility for public programs on the supplemental measure or the California measure as opposed to the official measure, because those are better measures. Uh, and so we're gonna include a section in our report that outlines some issues to consider when thinking about how to do that. Um, so we are gonna now start going through uh, some of the questions that have come in on the webinar and uh, we'll answer your questions. Great, so um, we have a, a number of Great. So we have a number of great questions um, that people have asked. So um, maybe we will start off with um, one, one uh, question was, can you explain more about which non-discretionary expenses are included um, in the supplemental and California poverty measures? So I'll let Melissa go ahead and... Okay, sure. So we mentioned um, child care expenses, um, out-of-pocket medical expenses, so that would be like premium costs, um, what you pay for prescription drugs, that sort of thing, um, work expenses, and uh, taxes. So that's both your income taxes, although many people living in poverty don't owe income taxes, and then also payroll taxes. So those are the taxes that go to support Social Security um, and Medicare. Um, am I missing anything? I think that's it. Yeah. Okay, we had an, another question um, that's about the data. So where can you find the supplemental poverty measure data for all states? Um, where can you find the California poverty measure for all counties? Um, and um, those those data are available. Um, the supplemental poverty measure data are available on the census website. Um, we actually have a slide. Let's see, where is that? That one. <laughs> um, that shows you the, the website where you can find the most recent supplemental poverty measure report put out by Census, which includes, um, and if you scroll down on that web page, it, has, it shows the thresholds for all um, areas in, in the United States, and the report includes some state level data. So um, that's one place that you can find it. Um, for the California poverty measure, um, there are um, there are reports available on both the websites of the Public Policy Institute of California and the website of the Stanford Center on Poverty and Inequality um, that include a lot of um, a lot of the the data for those. Um, one other question that was asked about the the California poverty measure is whether um, the data sets are available. Um, or if the data are available beyond the, the the reports that are published on the on the websites of the Stanford Center on Poverty and Inequality and the Public Policy Institute of California, um, and the answer to that is the the data sets are not um, publicly available. Those the California Poverty Measure is produced by researchers at um, at Stanford and at PPIC, um, and they release reports, but not um, not the data set itself. Um, but that said, uh, the researchers are able to run uh, custom calculations um, uh, and I'll say I'm a member of the of the research team that helps produce the California poverty measure through an affiliation with the Stanford Center on Poverty and Inequality so um, the researchers involved in that project can produce custom custom uh, tabulations and specific if there are specific data queries that that people are interested in so a way to access those is to is to contact the researchers who are who are involved in that project and when you can 
find that contact information on the on the websites where the CPM data is available. And I just wanted to add one thing about the supplemental poverty measure. So on the web on the screen right now, you can see a link to the report. In that report, the only thing they provide at the state level is, I believe, a two-year average for California. If you wanted that data um, by certain demographic groups or different years. Um, you would have to download the micro data and do an analysis, or uh, we've done that for you. Um, and we have that data, which we're hoping to publish at some point in the coming weeks um, by various demographic groups. So if you're looking for the supplemental poverty measure for you know, children under age six or something like that, you can get in touch with us um, to get you that data. Um, there was a question about older adults um, and how the data can be used to to look at the economic insecurity of older adults. Um, so, so, um, and I'll take that question. Um, <laughs> so, um, for for older adults, um, I, I, we would recommend using either the supplemental poverty measure or the California poverty measure and a key reason there is that um, a lot of older adults have significant medical out-of-pocket expenses um, and under the supplemental California measures those out-of-pocket expenses for medical costs are accounted for and under the official measure they are not so what that means is that if you are a senior who has really significant um, medical costs um, you might look like you're you're not in poverty under the official measure because um, it looks like you have enough resources to to reach the poverty threshold when in fact if you account for how much you are having to spend out of pocket for your medications and your doctor's appointments and all that in fact you don't have enough money to to meet the poverty threshold so um so um I, so again the either the supplemental or the um, california poverty measure can be used for those and um we at the budget center have produced some reports that that look at at um, poverty among older adults using those measures. So some of that's on our website, and that's uh, the kind of analysis that we will continue doing moving forward as well. Um, another frequent question that we get is about. Um, where the supplemental poverty thresholds are lower than the official poverty thresholds. And so we have an additional slide here that I want to bring up. <clears throat> so here's an example. This shows the poverty, the, the po supplemental poverty thresholds as a percentage of the official poverty threshold for a single adult uh, under age 65. And the blue bars show where the supplemental poverty threshold is higher. The orange bars show where it's actually lower. Um, and again, this is a common misperception that people think, oh, this, you know, the poverty rate is higher in California under the supplemental measure just because the threshold is higher. So there's sort of a higher bar to meet in order to be in poverty. But it's actually a bit more complicated than that. And so you can see with the orange bars, these are um, generally rural places in California um, where the supplemental threshold is actually lower than the official poverty threshold. Actually, this relates to another question that was asked, which is um, on the slide earlier that showed the official poverty measure versus the California poverty measure for different counties and how that looks differently, the, the dumbbell kind of slide. Um, ooh, let me go back to that really quick. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> there. Um, the question was, why does it? Why does uh, Santa Cruz County have a higher poverty rate than San Francisco County? Because isn't the cost of living higher in San Francisco? Um, and this is, I think, a really good question because it illustrates the fact that there's a lot of there's multiple factors involved in how um, the supplemental and California poverty measures um, improve on and are different from the official measure. So while it is true that the cost of living is higher in San Francisco, and in fact the um, the poverty threshold under the California poverty measure. Um, is higher in San Francisco um, than it is in Santa Cruz. Um, but there are more people with low incomes uh, in Santa Cruz um, is the most likely uh, driver of that difference. And so when you combine both the poverty threshold with the kinds of family resources that people have, you end up with more people in poverty in Santa Cruz because there are more people who um, whose resources don't rise up to the level of the threshold in Santa Cruz County compared to uh, the share of, of families in San Francisco County who are in that situation.
Okay, another frequent question that we get is, uh, what's the difference between the poverty, the official poverty thresholds and the official poverty guidelines? Um, and so we'll have a section on this in our report, but just very briefly, the thresholds are what are used to actually determine who's in poverty, the poverty rate. So they're used for statistical purposes, whereas the guidelines are used more for administrative purposes um, to determine eligibility for public programs. And the guidelines are based on the thresholds. They're just sort of simplified versions uh, of the threshold um, and they're updated for inflation each year. And we'll have more detail on that in the report. You can also contact us if um, you would like some resources on that in advance. Um, another question was, um, was can you use uh, these poverty measures to assess clients at the level of individual families? Um, I think this is a very interesting question and a question that we get sometimes uh, sort of how can the, you know, can the poverty measures like the supplemental measure or California poverty measure be usefully used to think about things like, is this family struggling economically? Should this family be eligible for a particular program? Um, how much does this family need to make ends meet? Um, and uh, in fact, in, in most existing public programs, it's usually something like the official poverty measure or the official poverty guidelines, as Alyssa was talking about, or some multiple of those that are used to determine which families are eligible for assistance. Um, but I think there is a good argument for thinking about um, the supplemental and California measures as addressing some shortcomings of the official measure. And this is an issue that we actually talk about in more depth in the um, in the publication that will be will be coming out. Um, but just to briefly say that um, you know it. I think it is relevant to think about the fact that the supplemental and California measures um, do a better job of capturing the local cost of living than the official measure does, um, and differences in that local cost in different parts of the of the of the state, um, and that the the supplemental and California measures also do a better job of capturing the range of of um, resources that families will use to help meet their basic needs. Give us just a moment to scroll, scroll through all of these questions that we're getting. I saw one question, which is whether the webinar will be recorded and available later, and it, it, it will be. It'll be available tomorrow. Um, and I think there's there one, one last question um, I see here that, um, that we will take on this webinar. And that's a question about basically are, are there state specific measures like the California poverty measure available in other states? Um, or, you know, would it be helpful for other states to have their own measures like the California measure? Um, and and um, that's, I, I think, I think. They're uh, organized uh, to specific measures in each. There are certain states that have them. So, with example, um, New York City actually has its own measure that's similar to the to the California poverty measure, but designed specifically for New York. Um, so, um, in the reasons why it's desirable to have state specific. Um, measures and I one thing that is uh, particularly because then you can look at um, poverty and economic insecurity at the level that is below the just statewide average um, so you can look at things like counties or metro areas um, and um, one thing that's worth noting is that the Census Bureau has been has done some work on looking at uh, producing uh, a su the supplemental measure in the data set larger Not slated for immediate release or anything like that, but Thank you, Sarah. 
thank you, Alyssa, for quickly walking through which I, what I think are pretty complicated issues and doing so easily and or at least easy for all of us to understand. Uh, and I'm glad the resource will be available tomorrow so that we can revisit and uh, those issues as, they, as those kinds of questions pop up in the future. Um, Thank you all of you online for joining us for today's webinar and for being part of this speaker series. Our next Policy Perspectives event will be on February 25th, where we'll be taking a deeper look at in child care systems by county, age, race, and ethnicity. This is the second part of talking about some of the um, issues involved there. So thanks once again for joining us and have a good rest of your day.